Welcome to our show, this is Zan Khan. Illuminati has been the center of conspiracy theories in the last decade. They have been accused of being behind a shadow world government. Today, the topic of our show is exposing the Illuminati. The guest of our show is Joseph Wages, a 32 degree Freemason who has written a book on the Bavarian Illuminati called The Secret School of Wisdom, the authentic rituals and doctrines of the Illuminati. Welcome to our show, Joseph Wages. This is Zan Khan. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Well, thanks for having me, Zane. Uh, Joseph, let's get to the first question. Uh, does the Illuminati exist or have they ever existed? Oh, sure, yeah. The Illuminati, uh, going back throughout history, there have been several groups. There was the Alumbrados in Spain, and then there was the Illuminés of Avignon. Uh, but the group that we're talking about today is the Bavarian Illuminati. They were founded in 1776 by a professor of canon law and lasted roughly from about 1776 to 1788, although there's still like a few uh, correspondence pieces going back to as late as 1792, and all the records sort of disappears after that point. Uh, have any other Illuminati order ever existed other than the Bavarian Illuminati? It is kind of the same question. Um, so short, short answer, no, because the uh, the Alumbrados in Spain and the Illuminés of Avignon, they were more like into a mystical form of Christianity. Uh, you know, it has a little bit of Gnostic elements and a lot of the stuff like what the Rosicrucians would identify with. But these guys are something different because they're not really uh, advocating for any particular sort of Christian mysticism. It's more like they're bringing in the ideals of the Enlightenment. And really the backdrop on this society is that um, it's founded by a professor of canon law, uh, in Ingolstadt, Bavaria. So at this point in time, Bavaria is controlled uh, by the Catholic Church with respect to its education system. And so the uh, Jesuit order is disbanded in 1773 and it allows a power vacuum for Adam Weishaupt to ascend to the position of uh, professor of canon law. And it's quite a contentious position because, you know, him not being a, a member of the Jesuit order, it's very contentious and they try to throttle him and withhold his paychecks. And so that doesn't sit exactly well with him in addition to the fact that their education system, it focuses less on like individualistic and critical thinking is more centric upon, uh, you know, like rote memorization. Um, a lot of the popular philosophical texts, for instance, were replaced with works by the early church fathers. And so this is kind of like the backdrop that inspires Adam Weishaupt to even want to create an Illuminati order because like when we think of secret societies or any kind of institution, they're speaking to some sort of need uh, that's inherent in society and with this uh, particular thing, um, it's, it's about education, or at least that's the, uh, the initial thrust of it. Uh, you're a 32 uh, degree Freemason, uh, Joseph, and also an author on the Illuminati. Please explain to me why are these societies, uh, you know, so much uh, focused on secrecy? Well, sure. So, like, really when we think about, like, secrecy, secrecy, it, it really serves a twofold method. So the first method for secrecy is obviously, um, like, a compartmentalization of information, right? So within the context of Masonic ritual, whether it's uh, within, like, the Scottish Rite or your regular Blue Lodge or even, like, a defunct order such as the Illuminati, um, really what secrecy was doing in that particular aspect was to um, provide candid thoughts for the membership. But I... I argue also that there's a there's a the, the second value for having uh, secrecy is that really it actually gives value to the initiatic system itself. Now let's take a look at like the Illuminati system. Uh, really, what they were trying to do was to make mankind happy by raising him to his exalted state and through a study of like philosophy, uh, you know, reason and ration, but more importantly, a strict moral regimen that mankind was supposed to elevate itself back up. And of course, this is all a big utopian pipe dream, but that was kind of the sales pitch of it. And so what ends up happening is that the actual secrecy itself, and it even says so in the uh, ritual book 
uh, that it, it gives value to the system. So you could say, for instance, like a, you know the golden rule, like do to others as you would have them do unto you. Well, if we take that same kind of example and apply it under the pomp and pageantry with ceremony, and what you end up getting is the initiate of that uh, doesn't take it at face value, but hangs on every word. And so what it really do does is it enforces that same simplistic value that normally you know you hear, but you wouldn't think twice about. Do it under the guise and context of ceremonies, uh, and actually makes an indelible mark in someone's mind. So where they're constantly referencing this as a as a frame of reference, and it it you know really just instills value into the system. So like you know there's the first uh, point of it is to uh, actually have open and candid dialogue, and then the second aspect of it is to actually add value to the system. Why is there such an obvious link between the Illuminati and Freemasonry? regarding symbolism and other things. Absolutely. So the uh, really what we're looking at here is the Illuminati, when they're founded in 1776, they're really more like a college honors fraternity, something like a Phi Beta Kappa or something to this effect. But by as late as 1778 or so, they get the idea to start merging with Freemasonry because at, at this point in time from, you know, 76 to 78, you know, they've only got... 10 members, and these guys that are the members of the Illuminati, they're like the uh, pupils of Adam Weishaupt. And so when they graduate and start going out into the world, they start experiencing, uh, you know, life, and they start joining other institutions. So they start integrating into Freemasonry, and the guys that are, when they, when they join these lodges, they're like, wow, this is a great system. We really should think of a way to link our system up with it. And so when you look at, like, the obvious connections between the systems, it's on purpose, because what they're trying to do initially is they're trying to graft themselves onto Freemasonry. But the trouble is, though, is that Adam Weishaupt, the founder, he only makes it to the second degree or the fellow craft degree before he stops attending meetings altogether because really what he's interested in is he's interested in uh, propagating his own secret order. And so what you have is the desire to integrate with Freemasonry, but the inability, right? Because he's not even a master mason. He's not, you know, far enough along to make that full integration. It's, you know, it's, it's physically impossible without knowledge of the third degree. And so what ends up happening is that um, in 1780, there's a guy named uh, Baron Adolf von Knigge who is insinuated into the order by a guy named Marquis de Costanza. And the Marquis de Costanza says, well, hey, look, uh, Knigge, I know you're wanting to make your own order here, um, so what, why don't you come join ours? And that's exactly what happens. Well, you know, Baron von Knigge is a very important person because, you know, he's a high-ranking member of the strict observance, and this is kind of like the dominant right in Germany at this point, and they're strictly observing a Templar origin of Freemasonry, when in point of fact, it's, it's, it's bunk because Baron von Hun makes the whole thing up. But at this point in time, you know, it's, 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 it's become clear to a lot of the members of the strict observance that, you know, the system really was a fabrication because it's said to be led by these unknown superiors. Well, after Baron von Hun dies in 1776, it becomes painfully obvious to the members that there are no unknown superiors. And that's what kind of gets Knigge to really think about, well, hey, you know, the institution of Freemasonry itself is a good system, whether or not it's founded upon spurious means. And so what he gets the idea to do is to reform the strict observance system. And, you know, maybe there's like a, a little bit of vanity in that. Maybe he uh, wants to be the founder of a new system or maybe in his mind's eye a restore of the system to what it's originally supposed to be. And ultimately what we end up with is that, uh, you know, he, he's thinking about uh, reforming the system. Them, but the Marquis de Scando says, uh, look, you know, come join our system. And so that's what he does. So really what you have, like in the first phase of the Illuminati's life from about 1776 to 1780, you have uh, a system that's basically like a college fraternity. But then when he joins in 1780, he actually has the intellectual and experiential uh, credentials to actually make this system not only fully integrate with Freemasonry, but ultimately what the goal is, is to reform for Freemasonry in general. And so at this point in time in the 18th century in Europe, you have a bunch of different rites where some people say that uh, Freemasonry, the highest purpose of it is alchemy. Some people say it's, you know, mysticism or theosophy. And then there's the, in my point of view, the correct view that really it's a uh, society that people, it's like a, like a self uh, directed initiatic system for self-improvement. It's like a self-improvement club, and really that's what the founding purpose is supposed to be, and that's what a lot of the symbols and allegories are supposed to teach, is uh, to apply these things in an in a allegorical method to one's life to improve oneself. And so Knigge kind of agrees with this whole system as it's founded, and so when they're trying to subvert these Masonic lodges later in the Illuminati's life, it isn't so much about subversion as 
as it is about uh, correcting and reforming, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, Joseph, we all know the Freemasonry was very powerful and it may still be very powerful. Uh, but many people uh, think that the Illuminati is also extremely powerful. Was uh, the Illuminati ever in position of power? Yes. And so if we look at like, you know, so the overt goal of the Illuminati was to make mankind happy. And then, you know, as you ascend up through the initiatic system, you realize it's through um, – through a proper education, but more importantly, a strict moral regimen. And so what Adam Weishaupt's goal to uh, to change the society for the better was, uh, let's look at the governmental structures in Germany, for instance. So you have various free states, you have duchies, uh, things like this. So there's it's kind of a mixed uh, governance system. But the point is, in any type of governance system, the, uh, the chief magistrate, whoever he might be, is not the final arbiter of power. Really, it's the people that surround him, his advisors, that uh, help to shape his views and opinions. And so Weishaupt's idea was is that through this proper education, through his quote-unquote secret school of wisdom, he would surround these magistrates uh, with advisors, and that's how they would uh, change society for the better. We'll see in its early days, it really doesn't get a lot of thrust because it's kind of like a long game strategy where you know these guys graduate, they go out to society, and gradually and incrementally over time, they will gain influence. But Kniga took a, a totally different approach to it. We're using the existing system of Freemasonry. Um, why wait for tomorrow when we can have change and results today? And so that's exactly what they went after is that he started surrounding all of these magistrates uh, you know, people that are already in, uh, in the Freemasonic system and convert them over to the Illuminati system. So short answer, yes, they did have an impact in society, but not in what we think. And it really, if we think about, like, you know, what kind of people would want to join Freemasonry or what kind of people would want to join the Illuminati when it existed? Really, it's people that are committed to the, you know, the the, the full per perspective of themselves and not without, uh, without the context of religion, per se, but actually within the uh, context of, you know, you know, applying oneself to one's faith, to uh, learning the moral precepts and tenets, and to applying it uh, strictly to one's life, and that's generally what the idea is. And also inculcating a lot of the lessons that uh, that are taught within Freemasonry itself. And so, what you get is the type of people that would even want to join one of these things. It's not your average type person. It's people that want to be the best people that they can be within the context of their faith and using the symbols and allegories of the craft. Uh, does the Illuminati still exist uh, as a functioning secret society? No, so so they, they kind of burn out. So what ends up happening is, so we go from the uh, the first phase of its life, from 1776 to 1780, it's like a college fraternity. Uh, from 1780 to 1784, it really functions more like a Masonic high degree system. And that's that's the point is to basically uh, graft themselves onto these existing systems, and then it changes in 1784 because Adam Weishaupt and Baron von Knigge they basically uh, go at each other uh, over kind of the direction of the system and like the, as far as like edits into these degrees, and it kind of slowly simmers and boils over, and it and it finally results in Knigge just saying you know the heck with it, and he quits the system, and so what ends up happening is is you have a, an incomplete ritual system. So like the last two degrees, they never had ceremonies put to them because Knigga quits before it actually happens. And so what we end up having is, uh, you know, Adam Weishaupt is left to his own devices. And so the system from about 1784 to 1785 kind of functions on its own. And then so the backdrop of all of it is there's uh, uh, Carl Theodore is the elector of Bavaria, and Carl Theodore, he gets caught up in this land scandal where he's trying to trade public lands for a title of nobility in Austria, and the public catches wind of it. And at this point, the Illuminati are already known. And so what he ends up doing is he ends up distracting the public's attention away from it by going after these guys publicly. And there's plenty of ammunition there for it because uh, within like, you know, like an Orthodox Catholic perspective, when these guys are trying to, uh, the things that they're trying to teach are strictly at odds with what the doctrines of the church, uh, not within like they're irreligious or atheist or anything like that. But what it, what it is essentially is that, you know, they're embracing the scientific method, popular philosophy, things like that, and also uh, trying to exert influence on society. And so it's easily spun the other direction. And the result is, is that Adam Weishaupt loses his position and flees into exile, you know, first to Regensburg and then and ultimately under the uh, protection of uh, Duke Ernst II. Uh, and so what ends up happening is, is the Illuminati, if it's the 
Bavarian Illuminati and the system is decapitated in 1785 by the founder fleeing Bavaria. And so for all intents and purposes, the Illuminati has been decapitated. And yet we have these outlying lodges and, uh, you know, like on border towns in France, northern parts of uh, Germany and even like the northern parts of Italy, Austria, places like that. Uh, so basically what you end up having is, uh, you know, the Illuminati system is decapitated, and so he flees into exile. And so, basically, the system slowly dies out, and by 1792, there's not a trace left of it, although, you know, really by 1788, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're done. Um, but what ends up happening is, throughout time, there's these various uh, groups that look to this uh, mythos of the Illuminati, like, you know, take on the early American Republic, you've got guys... Uh, Really, they're reading proofs of a conspiracy, which, although it's written in the 18th century, it's an 18th century conspiracy book, right? Because um, it's kind of – it's more opinion and less fact, and there's a lot of guys – like John Robeson, for instance, he's opining on the whole thing. And so it kind of freaks a lot of people out in the early American Republic, and you know, but a lot of it's for nothing. Like, there's not really any like uh, fire behind the smoke, and the smoke isn't even really smoke. It's just what he's fanned up you know, for attention and so forth. Um, so really – what ends up happening is there's there's not a lot to this. Now you have these various groups that spring up. So like there's like guys like in uh, the late 19th century. There's a guy named Theodore Royce and Leopold Engel, and they want to start this thing called the Ludwig Lodge. And so what they're doing is is they're essentially trying to restart the Illuminati. Well, the Illuminati were strictly rationalists into logic and reason and things like that. Well, these guys are into occult stuff, which is totally what the Illuminati was not about because the Illuminati was more like a learned society and less of a mystical order, and they were kind of repulsed by that whole thing. And so what ends up happening is is you get they try to do this restart, and it ends up not happening, and then uh, you know, Leopold Engel just kind of drops off. Theodore Royce goes on to start the Golden Dawn. Then you get Aleister Crowley comes into play. And so there's all these like, you know, Johnny come latelys. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to capitalize on the mystique and the prestige of the Illuminati's name, you know, being synonymous with conspiracy. So you have really two camps. You've got like a, a right wing version of what the Illuminati were and a left wing version. While the right wing version says, you know, we're totally disgusted by what these guys try to do. Then you have the left wing version that says, you know, hey, it was a great idea and we're all for communism and let's go do this. And really neither side is correct and both of them are just trying to capitalize. We all know that Freemasons consisted of members from all faiths. Uh, but what sort of belief system did the Illuminati consist of? That's a very very excellent question. So, um, in a lot of the early texts of the Illuminati, it was strictly uh, it was strictly uh, exclusive to Christians only, right? But you really can't say the Illuminati was strictly a Christian Masonic system, although that was the way the ritual system was constructed. And the reason it was done that way is because you know, take a look at it. Um, like the strict observance where Baron von Knigge comes out of. Um, basically, they're, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, a Christian Masonic order. And so he's kind of carrying on with that stuff. And so what you also see in society is that really um, Freemasons were kind of exclusive to being Christians only, although a lot of the guys in those lodges really didn't hold Orthodox Christian uh, perspectives. And so what we really see is that, the you know, if we look at by Knigge's own words and Weishaupt's own words, when Adam Weishaupt really starts going with this, uh, with creating the Illuminati system in like in the early, in like in 1776 or so, he's more of a materialist. So in a lot of ways, he's more of an atheist. You know, he's real into uh, reason and ration. But uh, really, what ends up happening is his first wife, Afra, dies, and so he uh, he's troubled by the thought that you know she's dead and she's never coming back and so forth. And so he kind of convinces himself uh, over to this uh, philosophical. Perspective perspective called idealism and really what idealism is for all intents and purposes it's deism or deism depending on however you want to say it and really it's the idea that there's uh one god um there's the immortality of the soul and everything else is up for grabs and that all of like the spiritual texts composed by people are really just in mentions of man because it's clearly not written by the hand of god it's written by the hand of man and that's that's what a lot of was going on there so you have like the facade of it being a uh, Christian Masonic organization, but on the other hand, really, like if you look at the faith of these actual uh, people constructing the system, you know, they're more deists. Like even Knigge himself says, you know, he was more of a deist at that point. And, you know, as he as he goes on later in his life, he basically uh, kind of reforms his views and uh, comes back to his Christian faith. And so what you see a lot of is a lot of these guys in their early years, uh, they're, they're more, uh, have more libertine thoughts and they're 
you know, kind of like questioning their own faith, trying to seek out their own identity in the world. But later as they grow up and they take on responsibilities and the burdens of life, they're drawn back to the uh, tenets of their faith. And so really what we see within the Illuminati system itself is that although it's on the on the surface uh, Christian Masonic order, in point of fact, a lot of the founders hold more deistical views. And, you know, that's really actually very common in the Enlightenment at this point in time because people uh, – both in the lower and upper parts of society have what's called a heterodoxical view. So on the surface, you know, they espouse to be practicing Christians, but, you know, in reality, like in their own personal lives and conversations, what they're, they're saying is, look, a lot of these things that are, uh, that are espoused in the Bible, you know, like there's, there's, they can't literally be true because we're, we're talking about fantastical things. And so really what it is, is, um, that inspires a lot of this is if you look at like the position of the Catholic Church, for instance, they're basically taking a more uh, literal interpretation of the Bible, but maybe that's not the way to interpret it. Maybe the correct way to interpret it is from an allegorical perspective, because regardless of the details in the story, if they literally happen the way they say they happen, there's the greater point is the message and the story, uh, you know, the lesson that's trying to be communicated. And I think that's how really like those two, uh, you know, opposite points of view actually can come together and operate. Uh, Joseph, how did the Illuminati perceive the concept of God? Uh, who do they worship? Within the book, The Secret School of Wisdom, you can turn to what's called the Docetist degree. Now, Docetism, uh, uh, within the context of like uh, Christian liturgy, uh, it's basically the view that Jesus was here, but he didn't have a physical body. Now, it's, it's, it's a Christian heresy is what it is, because it's basically saying that Although uh, he's here as the as the redeemer, on the other hand, he doesn't have a physical body and didn't experience physical pain. It's kind of like a Gnostic heresy, but it's not really to say that they're into like uh, Gnostic forms of thought. So they're working with the context of their upbringing, and they're saying that uh, that Christianity on the surface isn't literally true. But what they're talking about is they're saying that. You know, you know, through logical and secular reasoning, and that's what's presented in this Docetus degree, is that you know we can we can prove the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. Now, again, this is all utopian stuff because that's kind of the uh, theater that Vice Hop uh, operates under. And when we, when I mentioned before that his wife Afra died, well, this is the piece that basically it's him exploring his thoughts. And um, now this is a particular degree in a later book of his. It's called on materialism and idealism, and that'll be coming out in December. I mean, it's basically uh, the continuation and the perfection of this degree. And so what he's doing is is he's uh, he's establishing a thought, and he's basically laying out on, on the front end, like, what uh, the materialist or, quote-unquote, atheist point of view is, is that, you know, life exists for a little while, we die, and then we go back to being nothing, which is, you know, me personally, I think that's kind of an abhorrent view. And that was really kind of the, his philosophical worldview at the same point in time. Um, um, whereas it, within this uh, system of idealism or basically like applied deism, um, what he's, he's advocating for is that we can't possibly know the nature of God. We can't know any of these things. But what we can do is prove that he exists and that by uh, living a moral and upright and upstanding life that we honor him and we honor ourselves and we honor our fellow man. And so like specifically, like, what is the faith? You can't say it's exclusively Christian, and he's definitely not borrowing ideology from other places, um, but what it is, it's more like deism. Now, to your question, you were talking about, like, Egyptian symbology and things like that. Really, like, in the early days, like, so this is prior to Kniga joining the order. Um, like, we see that, that famous Minerva carpet with the, uh, with the pyramid, and it says DP. Now, the Eye of Horus stuff, that was... Uh, a 20th century invention, and it comes in a 1955 book uh, by Emanuel Josephson called Roosevelt's Communist Manifesto. And basically, it's like a bunch of anti-communist propaganda. Not to say that communism's good, but that's just what this book is. It's, you know, it's anti-communist propaganda. And so he, he lays the case in there that Roosevelt and Jefferson and all these guys, why, they're in the Illuminati. And also the great seal, well, the obverse, that's the seal of the Illuminati, too. And the only reason he can make a claim like that is because um, it... Uh, you know, none of the ritual systems have ever been published to this point, so he can kind of run with it. Now, that's not to say, though, that there wasn't a pyramid on this one carpet. So there's what you see is like a pyramid on a carpet, and there's DP on either side, which means Deo Proximo, God is with us, or near to God, depending on how you want to interpret that. And then there's uh, several stones on the ground. And so what they're saying is, is that, you know, 
look, our great work to perfecting uh, mankind is unfinished. And if we all work together, we can, t you know, take these last few remaining stones and set them into place. Um, but what Adam Weishaupt's trying to do is he's creating this secret society, and he wants it to appear like it's an ancient secret society, which is, you know, totally bunk. Uh, but that's what he's trying to do. So he's got basically like a lot of the uh, Greek philosophers um, is a lot of the impetus in the early days of uh, the Illuminati system. But like when you see, okay, well, what, what, why would he put a pyramid on this carpet? Like, where does that come from? Well, it can come from two places. The first place I want to point you to is uh, a book called Pyramidography in 1746 by John Greaves. And uh, it basically has the iconic uh, image of the pyramid on there. And what you see in this image is basically uh, the same thing that's repeated in uh, the early American Republic on some of their currencies and so forth. Uh, and what it is is that at this point in time in the 18th century, if you wanted to see the pyramids, you know, 99 out of 100 people are never going to go see them. So if you want to study the pyramids, you're going to stay at the same angle, at nearly the same, uh, you know, perspective and everything, you see the same iconic image. Well, also in addition to that, we see in 1777 in uh, the German language, there's a book called Sethos, which is kind of like the Egyptian mysteries or what they thought were the Egyptian mysteries. And in point of fact, it's just a bunch of junk. Um, but that's not really what he was kind of going with and so what we see is uh, also uh, there's on the cover of Sethos there's the whole like pyramid that's set up in the same orientation as John Greaves seven, or 1646 Pyramidographia and so what you're seeing is like the repetition of symbolism and ideology not because like they're communicating like an Egyptian belief or anything like that um, what they're communicating is is that like the continuity of symbology and it's from an earlier source and that's kind of like what we see come through there Okay, Joseph, last question. Why are most secret societies so obsessed with Egypt and their um, mythology and symbolism? So, like, if you look at, uh, well, you'd have to give me a specific secret society, but, like, within the, uh, well, let's just say within the context of Freemasonry proper, right? So, like, in some of the Scottish Rite degrees, uh, there's, there's, there's a, little, like, a little bit of Egyptian symbology, but that's not actually in the original system itself. That stuff gets added on you know, after the death of Albert Pike, like in the late 19th century. And for the same reasons is because a lot of people want to go back and refer to like antiquity, right? And, and by grafting on like that kind of symbology, you, you kind of get uh, really, like what you're getting is like, it's kind of like an illusion, like, oh, this is such an ancient system, but really that's not true at all. And th really the system would stand on its own without that kind of like inclusion of those uh, ideologies and so forth. Um, and so what we really see here then is with this, a lot of this Egyptian symbology, like, you know, uh, whether it's in ancient Egypt or ancient Greece or ancient Rome, you have like the mystery religion or the mystery cult, right? And so, and a lot of what the Scottish Rite does today, there's a lot of like comparative religious studies and not like that they're saying that, you know, oh, here's the difference between this religion and the difference between this religion. But what they're saying is there's a common theme between all these things and a lot of like the stories are repeated across different faiths and you know it, it studies uh christianity islam buddhism uh zindavesta from the hindus uh you know lots of different places and a lot of this symbology is studied and what they're sh saying is that there's a commonality between all these uh different systems and i know like you know well polytheism like say like in hinduism is not really a good example how but, and yet it is because what they're saying is is that a lot of these different religious systems they're studying the commonalities like the common elements in the stories and so by including like the Egyptian mysteries or the Roman mysteries or any of these other faiths like in, in mixing them all together what we're seeing is we're seeing like across the lines you know the evolution of religion and spirituality Thank you so much, Joseph Wages, for being on our show. It was a pleasure having you. Well, thanks, Dane. I look forward to talking to you again, buddy. This was Joseph Wages, a 32-degree Freemason and also an author on a detailed book on the Illuminati. We were discussing the topic of exposing the Illuminati. Until the next episode, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.